But for today, we're going to at least start section 10.2. And that's remind ourselves we been looking for we introduce the idea of an infinite series. The idea that we could take an infinite list of numbers and add them all together and still get a finite number back. And again, that might sort of at first blush seem unintuitive. We talked yesterday about Zeno's paradox on a more straightforward level, we take the interval from zero to, what I say, one half, from zero to one. I mean, this is Zeno's paradox, just reframed a little, but that subinterval has length one half. This subinterval has length one fourth. This subinterval has length one eighth. This subinterval has length one sixteenth, and so on. And you can keep cutting this distance in half, and you can do this infinitely often, and you'll get an infinite list of numbers. And when we put this infinite number of subintervals together, we get one we get the length of the interval. So again, it might seem unintuitive at first blush, but I hope it's not that surprising with this sort of as its background. Infinite series can be quite difficult to work with. They have very important applications, Usually those applications though um, involve some amount of rounding and finite series. We'll get to that down the road. Um, let me make the observation first of all. Infinite series. These are sums, remember. Um, we're adding an infinite number of things together. But it's good to use the word series instead of sums, because in general, these infinite sums do not act like finite sums. Um, your intuition can, uh, can lead you astray if you're working with um, infinite series and you try to treat them like finite sums. And there's a really famous example of this. Let's first look at this. Just a finite sum of numbers. This finite sum is equal to zero. And Addition is associative. You can do sort of whatever you want with this sum. 
Addition is associative, addition is commutative. You can put parentheses wherever you want. The sum is still equal to zero. You can move stuff around. So now this is negative one plus one plus one minus one. The sum is still equal to zero. Nothing you can do with moving these terms around or putting in parentheses is going to change that sum. Compare this to a famous example famous to the extent that any uh, thing in the calculus can be famous, I suppose. Grandi's series is the sum from one to infinity, negative one to the n minus first hour. And if you start writing these terms out, it looks exactly like that sum on the previous frame, except this is an infinite series. It never stops. It just keeps going. Um, so what is this infinite sum equal to? Well, we can still pair these positive and these negative terms up. And even though there are an infinite number of ones and an infinite number of negative ones, all of these pairs are zero. So Grandi's series is zero plus zero plus zero plus zero infinitely many times. And our intuition then is that Grandi's series is zero. But if we try to rewrite Grandi's series, we can get different kinds of solutions. Erase, please. Oh, why does it do that? Okay, let's briefly unshare and share again. And now Zoom is going to let me erase stuff. The video off, the video is off. Instead of pairing things up like we did just now to get to zero, my colors, we could pair the second and the third term the third term, I mean the fourth term and the fifth term, the sixth term and the seventh term, and so on. In particular, this series is one plus negative one plus one. There are the second and the third term. Negative one plus one. There's the fourth and the fifth term. Negative one plus one. There's the sixth and the seventh term. So if we put our parentheses in a different place, 
up here we had zero, 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 zero. Everything was zeros. Here we have one plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. So if we take one and keep adding zeros to it, what should that be? Well, presumably it should be one. So Randy's series, zero, one, something else. Um, this was actually, um, this was actually kind of a debate in the, early stages of calculus. And I mean, I think from a modern perspective, that's kind of insane. How can you just have this series, I mean, have this series and have arguments about whether it converges or not? And I mean, the answer was that early on in the history of calculus, nobody had really formally defined what it means for a series to converge or diverge. Everyone was sort of approaching it in a very loose, very informal manner. And because nobody had a proper definition, you got arguments like this. A uh, bit of a, I've always found it interesting at least, but as a historical side note, Grandy, after whom this series is named, he wrote an entire book on the series. It seems to me that it would get a little old after maybe the fifth page or so, but Grandy was a monk. And Grandy was interested in this series because he imbued it with religious significance. To Grandy, the idea that you could take this series and it equals zero, but then you rearrange things a little and suddenly it equals one. To Grandy, that was analogous to the creation of the Earth X Nihilo from nothing. That God started with nothing and then there was something. So he was interested in this series for philosophical as well as mathematical reasons. So I've said there was kind of this historical debate. Um, what does Grandy's series converge to, or does Grandy's series converge at all? Maybe Grandy series doesn't converge, and both of these numbers are red herrings. Well, centuries after the fact, mathematicians finally settled on a formal definition of convergence. So mathematicians finally decided what it means for a series to converge or diverge. And I'd like to analogize this a little because it's very similar to something we've done already. I would like to remind us how we defined an integral that starts at a finite number and then goes to infinity. Because this is very similar 
to what we have here. We have a sum that starts at a finite number and then goes to infinity. And when we had integrals, we defined this as a limit, as something goes to infinity. We replaced the infinity sign with a capital N, and we took that to limit. And that phrase I just said, replace the infinity sign with a finite number n and then take the limit is exactly how we're going to approach something. It doesn't actually map. Again, we sort of, uh, we can start at one, we can start at zero, we can start somewhere else. It doesn't really affect the definition. If we have an infinite sum, and let me, it seems to me that using capital and lowercase n is just begging for trouble. So let me use i as our subscript here. I is going from one to infinity. And we are going to use the exact same trick. We're going to replace the infinity symbol with a finite number. And then we are going to let that finite number go to infinity. And we are going to see what happens. Or at least this is how we're going to define convergence or divergence. This is our formal definition. And in this definition, these sums get a special name. They get called the partial sums. So we say that infinite sums are the limits of partial sums. Any questions so far at this point? And let me uh, make a few comments. In general, it is very hard to know whether a series Converges or diverges. And maybe that's kind of a discouraging thing to be hitting you with right off the bat, but it's undisputably true. Like the sum from one to infinity of one divided by n squared times the sine of n. 
I mean, on the one hand, this series is a little goofy. It's hard for me to imagine when it would show up in an applied problem. On the other hand, nothing in this series is super complicated. We haven't defined new functions. We haven't used super special functions that only math PhDs know about. The sign gets introduced in high school a lot of the time. Well, Nobody knows whether this series converges or whether it diverges. It's an open question. If you could figure it out, you could probably write the paper about it and get it published somewhere. So that's one kind of issue. And this is sort of worse. Again, maybe I shouldn't be making these value statements, but this is worse than when we don't know how to take an integral. Because I mean, when we don't know how to take an integral, fine, whatever, we can still go to Desmos or Mathematica or whatever and estimate it to n decimal faces. So the fact that we can take an derivative is really just a detail in applied settings. Um, obviously, there's nothing like that here. It's binary. It either converges or it doesn't, and we don't know which it is, and we can't ask Mathematica to approximate the solution to that problem. And that's just keep ripping the bandage off. If an integral does converge, no good way usually exists to say what it converges. So if an infinite sum exists, the natural question, I think, is as follows. Okay, we take these numbers, we add them up, we get a finite answer. What is that finite answer? And most of the time, you have, again, there's no way to answer that. Now, this is a little less severe than the problem on the previous frame. Because here, Technology can kind of come to our rescue. Technology can't give us any idea whether a series converges or not, but it can approximate a sum. And the way it does this is not especially fancy. Um, remember, Remember what it means for a sum, a series to converge.
if we want, um, if a series converges, it equals this limit. And we can go to Mathematica and say, okay, we want to know what happens as n goes to infinity. Well, of course, we can't actually plug infinity in, but we can add the first thousand terms together. And we can add the first million terms together. We can add the first billion terms together. And we can look at what happens as this n up here gets bigger and bigger, and we can approximate the sum that way. It might seem as if I'm kind of contradicting myself, by the way. Um, I've said, that we can't use technology to, um, to decide whether a series converges or not. But why can't we? I mean, obviously we're not getting a formal proof, but why can't we just let n be, um, why can't we add the first b of n terms and then add the first three of n terms and just see what happens? Well, I want to, I mean, the answer to this question, I've asked it, I've answered it, I'll put off the computer demonstration, until we're ready to talk about this series in more depth. But there are divergent series that grow very slowly. Like you add the first three of in terms together and you're still under 50. But the series diverges. And if you just keep adding terms, it will eventually grow to infinity. Yeah. So these very slow growing divergent series make testing for divergence or convergence using technology not work. Because maybe we add the first 100 trillion terms together and we get some small number, but the series is still diverging. However, we have some good news at least. It is, oh, before I give the good news, why don't I answer a question that I asked? I introduced Grandy's series, and then I said zero or one, or maybe it doesn't exist. And I said that people couldn't decide the answer to that because there wasn't a formal definition of convergence and divergence to work with. Now we have a formal definition of convergence and divergence. Let's hit Grandy's series with this definition and let's see what happens. Find me how I framed Grandy, n minus one. So, according to this definition we now have, we should take the limit as capital N goes to infinity. And we should see what this limit is doing. 
And if this limit approaches a finite number, the series is converging to that number. If it's not approaching a finite number, the series diverges. And this will also give us an excuse to introduce a bit of notation. I've said that we call these the partial sums. We write them S for sum. So S sub one is the sum from one to one of this. And it is one by itself. S sub two is the sum from one to two of this. And we now have two terms, one minus one, that's zero. S sub three is one minus one plus one, or one. S sub four is one minus one plus one minus one, that's zero. And this pattern is going to repeat. The partial sum is here, are one, zero. Now you see why we spent a, um, a section on sequences. If it wasn't clear before, this limit we're taking here is a limit of sequence of a sequence. These partial sums are numbers. So we're taking the limit of a sequence of numbers. And this limit, I mean, we're not approaching one because we keep going down to zero. And we're not approaching zero because we keep going up to one. In fact, we're not approaching anything. This sequence has no limit. So Grandy's series Diverges. It is not zero. It is not one. A lot of early mathematicians thought Grandy's series should be a one half. I mean, sort of on the logic that, well, if it keeps alternating between zero and one, Maybe we should define it to be the midway point, but it's not one half either. Grandy's series is a divergent series. Now, Grandy's series is a little special. I mean, most, most. Series that diverge, diverge in a much more unambiguous way. I mean, if everything was like this, people couldn't have spent centuries using series as a mathematical tool if every series was a big fight over whether it converges or diverges. 
a lot of series um, diverge very unambiguously. Yeah. And let me end this. Yeah, probably end this class period. by introducing the nth term test. The nth term test says, suppose we have an infinite series. And going back to what I said about our terminal, our, our notation often being kind of sloppy, I mean, I'm not going to put the number down there. I'm going to leave it blank. And that's because from the point of view of the term test, it doesn't matter what that lower number is. It's probably a one or zero, but it could be anything. The point is that we have some infinite C, that we have, let's try that again with the draw instead of the erase. The point is that we have an infinite series. And what on earth just wanted to, okay, <laughs> fighting with Zoom a little, but we got there in the end. What the nth term test says is that if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n, is not equal to zero, the series diverges. So, I mean, a lot of series, you can just look at them and say, no, no, that's not a convergent series. I mean, just putting, picking something out, the infinite sum of n squared plus one divided by n squared minus n. This series Diverges. No need to mess around with partial sums or anything like that. If we take the limit as n goes to infinity, of this expression, um, it's L'Hopital's rule, or it's I remember my algebra, and this has a horizontal asymptote, uh, one or the other. If we use, I mean, it's infinity over infinity, so we can use L'Hopital's rule using L'Hopital's rule requires that we hit it a few times, but we get there in the end, the limit is one. And one is not zero. And the nth term test says, okay, the limit isn't zero, this diverges, nothing more needs to be said. Questions about that, or really about anything we have done today. Then I must leave you, unfortunately, 
with a warning. I mean, it would be really nice if the end term test was just a uh, uh, one size fits all test for convergence or divergence, but it's emphatically not. I mean, if we have an infinite sum and the limit as n goes to infinity of these terms does equal zero. I mean, the temptation is to think well, if it doesn't equal zero, it diverges. Therefore, if it does equal zero, it must converge. That is sadly not true. If this limit does equal zero, The series might still diverge. So the nth term test is useful, but also quite limited. The nth term test sometimes tells us a series of diverge. Is. But if this limit is zero, the nth term test tells us nothing. So I mean, going back here, this is certainly going to zero, but because it's going to zero, the nth term test fails, and we can't know whether the series converges or diverges. So we're going to spend the next few weeks basically looking at the question of what happens when the nth term test Fails. What happens if the limit is zero and we want to know whether the series converges or diverges? What other tools do we have at our disposal for answering that question? All right, I will see you tomorrow. We'll finish integrals out. You'll get something in class and then something longer to take home. And um, yeah, I'll see you then.